Okay, everybody. So today we are going to be talking about a new standard for U.S. history and one of my favorites, and it's immigration. And now immigration is, like, as I mentioned in class, um, the story of America is the story of immigrants. And we are a nation of immigrants. And there are four, it has been four major waves of immigrants in the course of our history. Last uh, time, uh, I had you working on a introduction to the old immigrant wave, and that was in kind of the including of the British colonists, uh, but also outside of that, um, you know, Africans who were brought here by force um, to be slaves. Also, uh, Irish immigrants uh, migrated here in large numbers, as well as German immigrants. So that's your first kind of major immigration wave that occurs. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the second wave, and this is called the new immigration wave. And this is incurred something around 1800, 1880s to about 1920s, even a little bit beyond um, this major wave of immigrants finds its way into the United States. So right as when we're kind of talking about the second industrial revolution. So uh, the standard itself, as a read, students will explain the connection between the growth of industry, mining and agriculture and the movement of people into and within the United States. So we're talking about the into uh, the United States mostly today, and we'll talk more about it next time as well, as well as talk about the responses to people, um, the to immigrants as they come into the country as well. So the essential questions for today that I'd like you to answer is identify and explain the motivating factors that led to the increase of immigration in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And the second one I want you to answer is identify, explain how the new wave of immigrants in the late 1800s and early 1900s transformed America. So those are the things I want you to look at and answer in response to the essential questions that you're submitting on Canvas. So some context that's going to real basic and such since 1619 when Jamestown was established, the first town in America, um, America has become a nation of immigrant, immigrants. Um, you know, outside of the Native American people who were already living here and who are being pushed off their lands, more and more people from um, Europe and other countries are going to find its way into the United States. Um, the big waves that come in during the 1800, 1865, as I mentioned before, are mostly coming from Western Europe and Africa. So the United Kingdom. Ireland, Germany, they're the ones who are making up this old wave. And of course, the slave trade, which uh, will continue uh, to happen um, um, up until about uh, 1810s, uh, uh, it's outlawed. Um, but um, still, migration within the country is going to happen. The second wave is the largest wave of immigrants um, um, up until the one we're currently in. Are in. Um, and it's going to come mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe and uh, from East Asia. And these immigrants will face a number of challenges as they assimilate into their new homelands. So why do people come to the United States to begin with? Um, this is something we call the push and pull factors. So push and pull factors, um, when we're talking about push factors, these are the reasons why they're leaving the countries that they come from to begin with. And there's a great number of uh, reasons, and they're specific to every group. Every group has their own story of what's pushing them out. But as an overview and generalizing what's going on with these immigrant groups, here's what they are. Farm poverty, um, struggle to have food security or something along those lines. Um, that's something that plays a big role. Lack of jobs, lack of work. Uh, economic depressions happen not just in the United States. They happen elsewhere as well. Um, wars. Um, people sometimes, uh, you know, their countries are at wars. They end up becoming refugees, um, seeking asylum in, in safer places like the United States, which, you know, outside the Civil War doesn't have a whole lot of uh, armed conflict happening on its in, within its borders. Um, political tyranny, uh, political oppression uh, in their own countries, religious oppression. Sometimes people uh, of a certain religious groups need to escape because the government was hostile or the people of that country were hostile towards their belief systems. And sometimes overpopulation, which can also play a role in lack of jobs, poverty, wars. That, you know, These are all things that can kind of include into these, these other areas. Now, we're talking poll factors. We're talking like what's attracting them to the United States because, you know, there are other countries in the world, obviously, that they can go to. Most commonly, why wouldn't you not just like if you plan to return home, um, why not just go to the neighboring country if they're you know peaceful towards you? 
Um, but the United States, uh, because of the uniqueness of the United States and the fact that there was so much more available land and such, this is going to be one of the many pull factors that why people want to come to the United States, especially during this time period. So plenty of land and plenty of work. You know, with industrialization comes the need for more workers. And we'll talk more in detail about that in a bit. A higher standard of living um, when you compare it to some other, you know, the United States was a industrialized country ahead of the curve on industrialization from other countries, um, you know, outside of the UK. Um, so because of that, it could provide a higher standard of living for in many cases. We have a democratic political system, so kind of run counter into that political tyranny. When people got here, they were allowed to vote. They were allowed to choose their elected leaders. Um, that is something that they didn't have the opportunity to do so, and, and one of many of the motivating factors for these new immigrants. And the last one is that opportunity for social advancement. You know, if they come here and they're able to make some money, um, they can climb up a social ladder that they wouldn't have had the opportunity in Europe. Um, even if it's not going to happen for, you know, what the first generation of immigrants, at least, you know, they could hopefully send their kids to school and get an education and then get a better paying job and work their way up to the social uh, advancement and, and higher societies in general. So that's something that is making the United States a very attractive place for these immigrants to come to during this time period. So this is a map of kind of that second wave. And so you can see, you know, they're coming from a lot of different places in huge numbers. Um, and then, you know, also from the West, uh, from East Asia, Japan and Chinese immigrants were coming into the Western United States as well through uh, California and San Francisco in particular. So when they came um, during this time period, if they came within the period of 1892 to roughly the 1920s, 1930s, all new immigrants that came would have come over most likely by steamship. The airplanes going across the ocean had not been invented yet, um, but most of them came by and large by steamships. Um, and because of new and improved technology, it was fairly affordable for them to do so. They would have arrived in 1892, they would have had to go through this processing center known as Ellis Island. Ellis Island is an island that's right next to the Liberty Island where the Statue of Liberty is in New York City. Um, and they, this island kind of allowed the affordability of the United States government to process these new immigrants uh, in a way that they can control who's coming in to some extent um, at the same time, prevent any diseases that might be carried with them, um, as well as um, you know, giving them the papers they needed and direction to how to immigrate into the United States, find work and things like that. Uh, although most of that was done by you know, people within their neighborhoods. Um, so they gave medical examinations to people, especially if there was a high alert from a country, if they had an outbreak of disease, um, they could give them the medical exam to prevent them from spreading the disease to the mainland of the United States uh, in New York City. They would give them their papers um, that allowed them to kind of the idea of legal immigration. Um, and during this time, there really was no restrictions on immigration. Uh, like today, there's lots of restrictions. We have quota systems. Um, and you have to go through proper channels, and it takes years and years to be able to legally immigrate to the United States nowadays. Back then, if you were able to afford a ticket on a, a liner and crumb across the ocean and have like some sort of paper identification or whatever, and you know, whatever you could carry on your back, they'd pretty much let you in. It was not like it is today. And then they also had situations where they changed their names. And, um, you know, when we're talking about countries um, where you have names that are definitely more difficult for the Anglo-Saxon ton to pronunciate, they would change them to be more recognizable or more English um, and, and, and more white in some way. And, and the Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, um, waspy, essentially, right? So those are things that did occur. And in one story I do like to tell, um, you know, there was this football player, and I'm pretty sure he still plays in the league. Uh, his name is Richie Incognito, 
Incognito is not like his heritage name. He His family came from Poland. I couldn't tell you what their last name was, but it was definitely something that was hard to pronounce for your, your average uh, worker at Ellis Island. And so they would give them names and such. Well, somebody apparently had a sense of humor and just thought, well, this kind of sounds like Incognito, which means like in secret. So they changed the family name to Incognito and it stuck. Um, you know, and that's just something that, that occurred at Ellis Island. Um, kind of uh, when you look at it through the perspective of history today, it's, it's stripping them of their their identities of their old countries and giving them a new one that they can easily Im- or sorry um, um, assimilate into American society. So Angel Island is another place where they had a processing center for immigrants. If you were coming on the East Coast, you were coming through Ellis Island and through New York. If you were coming on the West Coast, you were coming through San Francisco and this place called Angel Island, which opened up in 1910. And it was a simple processing center for um, you know immigrants that were coming primarily through uh, from East Asia, um, Chinese and certainly Japanese uh, immigrants who came to the West Coast of the United States to work in agricultural jobs and farming and work on the railroads um, that were still being built at that time, they would have gone through this this center and such. So Angel Island, West Coast, Ellis Island, East Coast. So when these uh, migrants or immigrants arrived to the United States, you know, many of them did not speak English as their first language, and, and some of them would never learn how to speak English because um, once they arrive, uh, there would be people, you know, once they get off of Ellis Island and they go to the tip of Manhattan and a place called Battery Park, you know, you'd have people out there uh, by the docks uh, and, you know, yelling all different languages. And, you know, if you think about it, if you were coming off of the uh, boat and you're walking onto it and you're listening to all these people yell and you hear someone speak in your native, uh, native tongue, you are going to go to that person and that person was like, you know what, I've got work for you if you want work available. I mean, here's some, you know, residency area that you can live. And so what ends up happening is you create these ethnic enclaves um, inside these giant cities um, that we kind of identify as ethnic neighborhoods. And um, you have one particular ethnicity that would cluster in that neighborhood because it was familiar to them. They spoke the language that they spoke. They ate the food that they ate. They practiced the same religions that they practice. You know, it would be like you're in a new country, but you are still connected to your old roots in that sense. Um, so that is something that happens all over the country. Even today, you'll find ethnic uh, neighborhoods in some of the major cities uh, in the United States. Um, so some examples of that, Little Italy, and um, you have Little Italy's in lots of different places. Um, the most famous ones in New York, which is a bit of a tourist trap nowadays. Um, but uh, back then, you know, this where the Italian immigrants would cluster um, and they would change the cultural landscape to look more Italian. Um, all the signs were Italian and English, uh, but mostly Italian. Um, all the restaurants would be Italian restaurants uh, in Italian food. You know, that's how it went. Chinatowns you'll find all over the world and the United States. You'll find them in San Francisco. You'll find them in New York. You'll find them in Chicago. Um, you know, you'll find them pretty much everywhere. And I've been to the one in New York. And when you walk around the corner and you enter into Chinatown, you are entering into Chinatown. It is very obvious. Everything is in Mandarin or Cantonese, mostly Mandarin. Everything, um, you know, about the, the cultural landscape is way different. The food, you have these butcher shops where you have the animals hanging in the window. It's really a kind of cultural experience to go. And people there speak mostly Mandarin Chinese outside of the tourists that always make their way in there. So that's something that you'll find. You know, you'll find Koreatown places, Little Havana um, in um Miami for Cuban immigrants that come in the uh, later waves of immigration, you'll find them everywhere. 
So arriving in America really puts like forth this idea that they're coming here because they're looking for opportunities. And oftentimes that opportunities in the you know, workforce uh, are limited to immigrants uh, throughout every wave of history, right? Um, in the um, old wave, the Irish, when they came to the United States, um, they were barred from certain jobs. Um, they were barred from certain places, you know, um, there's a famous sign that says, uh, no dogs or Irish allowed. So something we'll talk more about with nativism in our next lecture. Um, but some immigrants did come here with certain skills. Um, if you remember from geography, this is known as brain gain that the United States happens to benefit a lot from because they brought certain skills that help with industrialization. The Welsh were really good at metalworking. The Germans were very good at, um, as machinists. Um, Scandinavians were very skilled sailors. Not all of them, but like as a, as a group as a whole, that's something that they, they just happened to specialize in much more so. Um, Jewish immigrants came here with um, talents in banking and tailoring. You know, go back to the countries that they were living in. You know, they were barred from owning land, so they couldn't be farmers. So when, you know, they're trying to survive, you know, they, they learn skills that really, you know, at first were not that important, but as industrialization happened, became more important. And so Jewish people became very successful uh, in America, um, you know, with these particular traits uh, and skills. However, for the most part, when we're talking about the Second Industrial Revolution, there's a larger need for unskilled workers. And there are jobs that simply were so difficult, paid so little, um, were in such a you know horrendous conditions that people born in America felt that it was way beneath them to be able to do those. Um, and they would hold out for better paying jobs and jobs that uh, would help elevate their standard of living from previous generations of, of you know, their family. But when you're an immigrant and you come and there's only so much work available, the jobs that you can get are the jobs that you want. And so the, a lot of the unskilled labor jobs that were done by immigrants include railroad, factory work, of course, mining, lumberjack, farming. You know, immigrants come to this country and they help build this country because they're willing to take those jobs and do the backbreaking work for very little pay and in dangerous conditions because they really sometimes had no other option. And this is how it starts um, for every immigrant group. When they come to the United States, typically in large waves like we've seen, they're going to start and they're going to do the lowliest jobs. And then hopefully their kids can go to school, get an education, and then they can get a better paying job and then work their way up the social ladder. Um, and that is the truth for pretty much every immigration wave that has happened in the course of our history. In general, um, immigrants are definitely, like I said, more willing to take those lower pay cuts and such. And this is still true today. Um, some of the, the more difficult jobs and, and labor intensive jobs that are done in our country are done by immigrants. So. It is estimated, you can't ignore the fact that about a third of the immigrants that come to the United States during this time period do ultimately return to the country of origin. Um, and, um, but the other two thirds end up staying and make America their new home. And so because of that, America becomes this giant melting pot of many different uh, ethnic groups and many different religions. And that's always been how the story of America is. Um, you know, and so next time when we talk about nativism, we'll see, you know, every generation of immigrants deals with pushback where there are people who are not happy about uh, the big wave of immigrants that are coming in um, and why that is and so forth. So we'll talk about nativism much more so next time. So the essential question for today, uh, make sure you answer them on Canvas and submit them. Uh, and so that um, we can, I can grade them and uh, make sure that you're getting it. Um, it also is a gateway assignment if you want to retake the quiz uh, on 1.2 when we ultimately do get it. You will have an assignment to work on uh, where you're going to investigate in more depth five groups of this new wave and the specifics of their push factors, their pull factors, what jobs did they do, where did they end up uh, settling, 
And then what are some other challenges that they faced as they were trying to assimilate into America? So those are the things that uh, we'll work on as far as the assignment that's tied to this lecture. Other than that, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, take care and stay healthy.